Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Executive Insider. My name's JT O'Donnell, and today we are going to be talking to consumer packaged goods executive Lisa Perry, specifically on the concept of managing through chaos, which is very timely right now. So I'm so excited to have Lisa on the show. Uh, this is the show that gives you answers. We're talking to the best and brightest out there about the practical advice that they can give from firsthand experience. So with that in mind, I want to be able to bring Lisa right up on here so that you can see her. Hey, Lisa. Hi, good morning, JT. It's so good to have you here. So listen, consumer packaged goods, becoming an executive and an expert in that, what's the journey there? How did you get there? Ah, uh, well, I just, I loved understanding consumer behavior and connecting the dots and how that translated to driving products. And so I started uh, working for a consumer packaged goods company like Coca-Cola and ConAgra and uh, just started my journey that way. It was fabulous. And I love working for companies like that. Oh, that's amazing. So when you think about this idea of chaos, right, because that's what we want to talk about today. Um, I You wrote this incredible article for our site, and folks, we're going to link to that so that you can check it out. And one of the things that was really interesting to me was that you mentioned the fact that you were a latchkey kid and that this somehow actually played a role in your decision making as a business leader. So I'm with you. I was a latchkey kid, right? The MTV generation. Talk <laughs> us through that a little bit. So there were four key things that really drove my decision making as uh, I was a latchkey key. The, the first thing was uh, quickly making decisions uh, and learning to live with those decisions and um, uh, learning to uh, learn from those decisions. The next thing was uh, being thick skinned um, and having to um, learn from that, you know, when I was a latchkey kid, uh, there weren't that many people, um, parents who would allow their kids to uh, play with me since there was no parents uh, on um, at home with me. So uh, I learned quickly to develop that thick skin and that helped me in the business world to make decisions and take criticism pretty well. The third thing was being creative. Not only was I a latchkey kid, I was an only child, so boredom set in pretty quickly. And so that uh, creativity helped me in terms of problem solving and developing business strategies and driving team engagement. And the last thing was, as a latchkey kid, um, I was dealing with many crises and uh, chaotic situations, probably self-inflicted, but that helped me as a business leader in, in terms of a sense of calmness um, and uh, leading through chaotic situations. I love that. And I think the fact that you can look back in your life and take those things and apply them is huge, right? I think that's part of the reason that we as executives um, excel, because we do take the time to reflect and figure out what happened in our childhood and how we can use it to our advantage. Um, so Let's move into this concept, though, of chaos, because there are always, I think, telltale signs um, that there's some chaotic, you know, stuff going down in an organization. But I'm not sure that everybody really dials into that. So what would you tell leaders to watch for? What are the warning signs? Well, there are a number of warning signs, but some of the top ones are um, the inability for companies to, um, you know, be focused, uh, high stress among employees, and uh, loss of customers. Those are the really key ones that people should watch out for. Today, a lot of uh, companies are dealing with market shifts, uh, reorganization, and mergers and acquisitions. I can give you an example that, that I went through just recently with a company I worked for, uh, we were over the weekend acquired and nobody in the company knew, including the president. And so come Monday, we had to do a complete shift of our whole business approach, dealing with the acquiring company and doing a whole new mode of operation. And as you look at the, the market shift that's going on today, companies are having to, you know, completely, you know, deal with work from home. And some companies are prepared for that because they've been doing it. But other companies aren't prepared for that at all. And it's a complete 
uh, shift from what they're doing. And other companies are having to completely look at how they're approaching their consumers in a different way. And it's causing a lot of stress on their organizations. And leaders are having to now step up and it's in a good way to, to manage through this stress and chaos on their organizations. Yeah, I love that you gave those examples because it feels like so many people are going full throttle in one direction and it's literally every business has been thrown off its rails, right? Right. And told go in a different direction. Well, when you're going that fast, I mean, it, it just, you're right, immediate chaos. You've just slammed on the brakes. It's incredible. And I, I, I don't think there's an executive out there right now that isn't feeling some form of chaos from what's going on right now. But the question is, do they have the ability to handle it, you know, which is so right. scary. Right. So one of the ways that you've handled it, and I loved it in the example in the article that you wrote for us, is this concept of ruthless prioritizing. I thought that was great. Right. Um, but I think that's a huge challenge for companies. The bigger they get, the harder that then becomes. So talk us through ruthless prioritizing. What is it and how does a, an organization, especially like a larger organization, try to make that happen? Well, it's one of the biggest issues right now um, that, that companies face and uh, companies want to do everything. And, it, you know, it, there's a lack of prioritization and focus. And it's one of the most important things for companies to do right now in this time of, of uh, chaos. Um, if they look at the big picture, right, there are two to three things that companies should be uh, focusing in on in terms of accomplishing over a specific time period, say two to five years. And then there are priorities that, that they need to look at in order to accomplish for their long-term vision. And then of course, you wanna be able to measure the work that you're doing in order to show progress. Those are the, the key things that companies should be looking at right now. I love that. And I just want to ask you a follow up question there, because it sounds to me like what you're saying is it's not just about prioritizing for the business, right? So that you can get focused, but also for the people. Am I right? Like dialing them in just on a few things as opposed to many, because you're right, that two to five year vision is huge and there's going to be a million steps to get there, but you're pulling it in and kind of getting everyone, especially the team to take a breath and uh, make things feel more manageable. Does that sound right? Right. It's, it's the priorities, right? What do you want to accomplish, right? And get done. And how are you going to measure that? Right. Cause there's so many, so much noise coming at people right now mm -hmm. that you really want to get focused and get people moving forward in the same direction. Yeah. It totally makes sense to me. So key right now. I think everyone's just looking for something to feel, I know they're not going to say normal, but just a little less chaotic. Like you said, that's huge. So let's talk about that. How do you encourage team alignment? So, you know, if you've, you're saying, okay, we've got to prioritize, we've got to get into this, but now I need everybody on the same page. Well, we know that can be a challenge. You're going to have those fringe people, you're going to people that, oh, their idea wasn't picked, whatever. How do you get everybody on the same page? Right. So, um, you know, setting goals and expectations, not just for the, the team, but also for uh, individuals. Right. And I'm going to, hammer this, but prioritization is key, right? Um, you know, again, so much noise is coming at people that prioritization is going to be key. And then, um, you know, clear, um, you know, supporting the decision making process is also important. Giving tools and um, uh, the tools that that people need in order to make those decisions and supporting and um, you know, for people to be able to make and act upon those decisions is going to be key. Now, the the challenge is that if people are still resistant, then I think you need to sit down and uh, have a have a serious conversation to say, hey, here's where the company is going. And here's the business strategy. And here's our expectation of you. And sometimes what happens is, you know, People come on board for a specific reason for the company. And when a company makes a big shift, they can't align with that new strategy. And that's okay. You know, sometimes you just need to separate and it's perfectly fine, but you have to have those serious conversations. I love that about you because you're respecting the fact that they made a decision 
to join, right? As opposed to, I think it's very old school for people to to say, just get in line, you know, hey, if we're changing direction, fall into it. I think you're saying, look, I respect you. You came on with one set of goals. We've shifted priorities if this isn't right for you to move on, but this is the direction. So it's totally your choice, but we either need you to row this way or find something else, right? Right, completely. And it's just having that honest conversation because, you know, sometimes people have been there for quite a long time in a company and it's just a complete shift in where a company's going. Yeah, that's a big one. I think if somebody's been there for a long time and then the the chaos sets in, that they can be pretty resistant to change. Like you said, it's just uncomfortable. Right. So you talked about tools and I you talked about empowering your people. So talk to us about project management tools. Like what do you recognize? Um, you know, recommend, what do you think is um, recognized as good options when you're trying to develop organizational collaboration so that you can improve the productivity? Well, there's so many out there, but a number of key ones are, and I'm sure a lot of people have have heard of these, but, you know, there's Asana, there's Basecamp, SharePoint, Trello. And the great thing is that they can cost as low as $5 per month, up to 200 per month, depending on the um, number of users and the type of package that that you get, but there are also ones out there that that are readily available to people, like Excel that you're already using for project management, and then for for collaboration type of packages, you know, uh, for transparency, there's there's uh, Google Drive that's also readily available. So you just want to make sure that when you're looking at project management tools, that you're looking at those collaboration type of um, uh, tools that are available. And, and like I said, there's, there's low cost ones that are really available to you and, and ones that are more complex. So lots out there for people to choose. Yeah, I love it though. But I love that you're saying, look, you need the tools, right? That the tools are what's going right. to get us all to, and, to and, essentially. And yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. The, the tools are the key to, to keeping everyone on track and delivering on that focus that you've been talking about. And right now, what's key is that as people are working from home, you know, and for those organizations that aren't used to working from home, having that transparency and collaboration is going to be key in terms of document sharing. I totally agree. So in this article that you wrote, you talked about three things for driving change, specifically providing impactful leadership, improving business processes, and developing a strategy. So is that only in chaotic business decisions? Do you feel like that it only works well in those situations? Is that a universal principle? What do you think? Well, no. I mean, clearly, you'll want to be able to use these ongoing because they're great tools to have. But in times of chaos, they're so critical because companies are being pulled in a hundred different directions. If you take what's going on right now with the coronavirus, right? Um, you know, having a strategy for the next 30 days so that companies can stay focused and, and not listen to all this noise and have a 30 day strategy where every employee's drumming to the same beat is going to be critical. Mm -hmm. And then, as I just mentioned, having, you know, tools that, that people can share on at home documents and, um, you know, be able to access in a, in a, in a uh, place where everybody can can see is going to be critical. So those kinds of things are are critical during this time. But ongoing, of course, you know this is going to be help every uh, company going forward. I totally agree with you. All right. Well, we want to take a bunch of questions. I don't want to be the one that monopolizes all of the questions here. So folks, feel free to pop your questions in the chat. We're talking to Lisa Perry. She's a consumer packaged goods executive. And we're talking about how to manage through chaos today, which I think is unbelievably timely right now, which is huge. Um, first of all, comments from Thomas. He's saying, I really like your comment on ruthless prioritization, but how have you managed to managed up to the CEO and leadership team. Often you get nods of agreement, but not real commitment. Oh, I totally agree with that. So let's talk about that a little bit. How do you get upper management to, you know, actually do the ruthless prioritization versus, you know, they say it and then a week later they come in and they want to do something new. Yeah, it's it, completely, Thomas. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I've run into this so many times and the issue is to show what happens when you don't have the prioritization uh, showing that um, that the team is is 
going in a hundred different directions, that they're being pulled, you know, constantly in in all these different directions, that if we don't have the prioritization, we're not going to get the results that's required. And I've shown that in many different directions to um, show that, that uh, you know, we're not getting the results. Here's what's happening. And that's been pretty effective in what I've done. So that's one way that you can do that. Um, I've done it over and over in, in the businesses that I've led is just showing how we're not getting results for senior leadership. I love that. Such a good point. So we have another question from Bill. Bill says, what do you do when the anxiety and stress level is in high gear because people feel they're not seeing the results fast enough from the prioritization? Yeah. So um, I think you've got to get some small wins and that's really important. Um, being able to make sure that you've got a plan in place and being able to get something, just one thing, um, you know, uh, whatever the objective is, making sure that it can be a quick, um, quick hit. Um, that's going to be key so that the team feels like they're getting some victory. So if, even if it's, you know, low hanging fruit, get something out there that you can get to be able to say, Hey, we've got some victory here. That's key to get to momentum going with your team. I love that. You're really talking about, I love that the wins are sort of a way to get that energy, um, that momentum. And that leads to another question that I have, which is what, when you talk about executive presence in a time of chaos, do you think there's a certain style that's predominant that maybe isn't necessary, say in good thriving times? Do you notice that there's a, a you mentioned energy, is there a style or an approach that you think works better in chaotic times? Um, I think, you know, having, uh, a leader that is compassionate and listening, but also can um, be sure that they've got like a vision going forward and driving works. Um, I've seen that be effective. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the energy level has to be there, right? It's too calm and there's not enough of a sense of urgency too high and you're feeding into that anxiety and that chaotic state, right? It's got to be somewhere in the middle, would you think? I, I, I completely agree. So you know, like I said, the, the the ones that can can listen to to everything that's going on in the company, the ones that can can share the compassion, but also have that drive to say, here's where we're going, here's the focus, and we're going to get through this. Really, are effective. That's awesome. All right, so Ellen is asking, can you share a time where you really saw the results of from going from chaos to to calmer, and in your you know your own kind of put this all in context? I think is what she's asking. Sure. Um, I recently worked at a cannabis company where um, the cannabis industry has been just a chaotic state. Um, in terms of trying to get to market with uh, federal challenges and um, startup company mode and uh, all of the restrictions that's been placed on it. And this particular company didn't um, have any direction from the leadership. And, you know, coming into this company, and it's, it's part of what I wrote in this article, but coming into this company, um, really having to put um, and helping management understand that we needed to put some priorities in place and get um, a focus of what we were doing. And that was very challenging. And I think somebody mentioned already is how do you get management to get focus? And so I worked very hard with management to say, what, what are the five things that we're going to do going forward? And to get my team rallied and supported, there was low morale in the team. Um, they were just uh, most wanted to quit. So I really needed to get the team focused and get them um, responsibilities that they, they would uh, be supportive and, and happy about what they were doing. And then um, really drive and get those quick wins. Um, so we got really quick wins of, of, so the team morale was up. They were felt responsible for their work. We got the priorities that aligned with the leadership. And so that started to really turn things around. I love that. So Marilyn has a fascinating question. She said, I've been in several organizations where the chaos creeped up on us. 
I think that's interesting. What can you do to better avoid chaos creep? <laughs> so I've actually seen that too, right? So a company seems to be doing fine and it's not suddenly this massive thing that throws them into chaos. It's just somehow things spool out of control. Have you ever seen that? And what advice do you have in those situations? I have seen it. And again, I, it goes back to priorities and I can harp on this all the time. It's the priorities and, and communication. Um, so I think you've got to come back to um, what are our priorities, what are our plans, what are our strategies, and have we lost the focus? Uh, and I said, you know, companies have a lack of priorities and focus, and you've got to get back to that. It, it's so key in terms of driving companies and where they're going and lots of noise coming at, and that's what happens with companies. They lose that, and then and then it's the creep that comes up. The creep, and you're just going in a hundred different directions. So if you can really say, what are we going, what are we doing, where's our focus, and then that, that noise shouldn't be happening. I know, love, stick to it. Evan's got a great question. Do you look for a different type of person when you're hiring in order to bring, you know, chaos into alignment. It's true. Cause a lot of times when there's chaos, you're probably doing some new kind of hiring. Do you profile differently? Do you look for different, um, certain things in candidates at that point? Yeah. I like to see candidates who can, um, really stay focused, who can, um, help collaborate and, uh, communicate effectively and, um, not be bogged down with, um, and pulled in a lot of different directions. So those are the candidates that I really like um, to see. Um, not pleasers. I don't want to see pleasers. Um, um, I really want people that are focused and can drive um, drive the agenda. That makes sense. That's true. Charles is asking a question similar to that around what do you do to help build up the team in terms of their, um, you know, that they're kind of like tribal element and, and they're feeling they're trusting one another during times of chaos. Cause that's true. I think you see trust start to fall apart when a company's in chaos. So how do you rebuild that, you know, that team spirit and that team trust? I think it takes a lot of communication and a lot of connecting and uh, team meetings and, communicating and making sure that everybody knows their roles, everybody knows their responsibilities, and that you're communicating on a personal level um, and making sure that there's a connection um, so, so that you're all working together and you've got some kind of a bond so that they feel that there's a purpose, that they, that they know what they're doing and that they feel connected. Um, I felt that that has worked in terms of people wanting to come in and feeling that they've got a job and that they they know their roles they know their responsibilities and they 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 want to do the job they they feel connected to the company I love that Chris is I'm going to paraphrase a bit because it's long but Chris has an interesting question essentially he says two times now he's joined organizations where he got in there and they said they had chaos and they were looking to make change and get everything organized and then that didn't turn out to be the case is there a way to, in the interview process, spot when a company is saying they want to bring chaos under control, but they're not really ready? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's um, a tough one. Yeah. You know, um, because you got to make sure you're talking to the right people, right? Um, you know, it starts at the top. Um, and, you know, organizations really need to want to change. And it starts with the leaders. And, you really want to drive that change and work with those leaders to be able to do that. So it depends on who you're talking with in the interview process to be able to find that out. I mean, you can ask those questions in terms of, you know, what, what are your priorities? Um, you know, where's your focus and those kinds of things. But if you're not, if it's not coming from the top and working there, you've, you kind of got to disconnect. Oh, yeah. It's so tough too, right? Because they're not always going to be forthcoming, right? right. There's, there can be that bait and switch situation as well, which is really, really hard. Um, I have a follow-up question on that though. So what do you do when you get in there and you realize it it can't be saved, right? You get, you, you get in there, you, you did your due diligence, you think you've got a shot, but you get in there and it's, you're several months in and you realize now this isn't, this isn't going to fly. 
what do you do? Well, I think, you know, if you've tried tried all that you can, right, to work with um, the leaders and, and going up to the senior executive leaders and try to do the priorities and try and get focused and try to put a plan together and communicate. And the organization is just not ready to, to um, make that change. You know, if the leaders are, are just saying, no, they're resistant to that. I, I don't think there's much that you can do. You know, if you're, you're really trying to be that leader and, and make that change, but the, the top is not doing it, you know, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. Yeah. And I think at that point, you're probably looking for a new job, right? But you're doing that really tactfully. I think it happens. I've noticed just it's a high stakes game at the executive level, right? The higher up we go, just trying to find that fit. I've noticed overall, it's just a it's become in some ways a lot more of a gig economy for executives. We go in, we do our thing for a couple of years and then things change and, and we move someplace else. I don't know if you're seeing that as well. I think when you work with chaos, that's a little bit of, that comes with the territory, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I think you could make you could make an impact in your area, but if the leaders at the top aren't aren't willing to change, there's there's not much you could do for the overall culture. I think you could make an impact in your area. It's so true. Um, Thomas has another question, which I love, which is, do you see a cultural impact on this? Like international companies, for example, it seems some cultures find their value in chaos and firefighting. That's a good point. Some pe- some cultures almost think they thrive in it, so to speak. Yeah, and and definitely there is, but I think you could still manage through that chaos, right? I still think you can um, put priorities in place and um, still put a plan, um, even when there's the chaos. You can still try and manage through that. I mean, I've had companies like that who who like to live on the edge, right? But you can still try and help leaders put some priorities uh, through that. You know, let's live on the edge. It's funny because I almost think that somebody like you who does this regularly, that's almost becomes a, almost a high performing culture that's ready to take those risks because they feel like they have the structure in place. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Okay. Well, this has been amazing and 30 minutes always goes way too fast. Um, (laughs) Thank you everyone for your questions. Lisa, this was extremely helpful, but we always give you what's called the last word. So any final thoughts um, and things for people to keep in mind? Well, I think this is just a, a fabulous time to keep in mind that we're uh, in this huge market shift going on, that there's so much opportunities for managers to step up and really take um, these skill sets and uh, be able to thrive. So um, I hope it was helpful and um, please reach out with any questions. Speaking of that, can you tell everybody where can they find you? Where should they hunt you down? Uh, on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm available on LinkedIn and uh, you can also reach me on uh, my email at Perry, uh, P-E-R-R-Y-L-L-I-S-A at Gmail. Perfect. We'll make sure that both of those are in the links for you as well, team. All right. Well, this is another episode of Executive Insider in the Books. Lisa, thank you again for stopping by. Thanks everyone for listening. And as we always tell you when it comes to executive leadership, if you want to win, you got to work it daily. So make sure you come back and listen to us next time. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you, JT.